stream now. Okay. We are live. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out this Sunday morning to our virtual event. Uh, first off, I just want to note for those on Zoom that we're streaming on uh, live on the internet and for everyone joining us via the live stream, also welcome. Um, this event is put on by the Tempest Collective. Tempest aims to create a space on the left to come together to discuss and debate our goal is to put forward a revolutionary vision that is clear and understandable, that weighs in on strategic and tactical questions, offers concrete guidance as well as political theory, and presents a consistent set of working class politics. Hello. Please check out the Tempest website or follow the page for more events and info about the collective. This event today uh, is coming out of this, the Omicron surge that started to slowly recede uh, we see politicians from both major parties in the U.S. stampede to roll back public health measures such as mask mandates and vaccine requirements. So today's discussion is about how capitalism has made the COVID crisis much worse than it should have been and what we can do to get out of this pandemic and prepare for the next one. We're joined by three lovely panelists who will each be giving uh, introductory remarks followed by a discussion. The discussion portion of today's event will not be live streamed, but will only be on the Zoom. So if you would like to partake in that, please uh, follow the bit link to the Zoom and join us uh, via Zoom at that, at that time. Uh, so to start out, um, we have, oh my goodness, I'm messing up the name again already, uh, Art Kyle, uh, who is a coordinator of Access IBSA project which campaigns for access uh, to medicines in India, Brazil, and South Africa. Please take it away. My, my name is Achal uh, Prabhala, uh, which uh, you know, can be a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it's actually just pronounced exactly as is. Uh, I'm sorry for the slightly strange setup. I am uh, traveling, uh, which is an unlikely event, which uh, I've had two years of not doing, and therefore I'm spectacularly unprepared for. Um, as I, I speak to you, we scheduled this uh, prior to me knowing that I could travel. Uh, but luckily, the, the gods of uh, COVID variants have allowed me to. And so here I am. It's a pleasure to be here. And I will start off by, um, by speaking to something I think that is a current moment in uh, the American conversation, which I think closely relates in some really interesting and unexpected ways to the kinds of situations I face, the kind of situation that my parents currently face in India, which I'll explain a little more about, uh, and which in one way or another, every single person who lives in a poor country, which is roughly half the world's population, a little under 4 billion people face at this moment. And what I'm going to start with um, is uh, to, to, to recount uh, a series of dialogues that have been happening in, I think, what one might call independent media. It's a set of people who write uh, against whom I think many of us have fairly strong feelings for and against. Um, but regardless of, I think, which way our politics tend, there is something interesting that's going on with this dialogue and which I would like to highlight because I think it's important uh, and, and we should understand it better. Over the last couple of weeks, especially, um, there's been a buildup of a resentment against the US government, against US government medical advice on everything ranging from hot button issues like uh, whether children at school should be masked uh, to whether vaccine mandates are good or bad or necessary. Uh, but one of the things that came out in a recent dialogue that I overheard was an American journalist called Barry Weiss who went on a show uh, hosted I think by Bill Maher where she began by talking about her frustration at having followed the rules, taken the vaccine and yet seeing no end in sight to things like masking and insecurity and panic. This argument has been since uh, launched by several people, uh, many of whom uh, write on a, a, a rather vibrant platform called Substack. 
And while they're speaking to many things that are particular to the United States, which I have no uh, right to wade into and, and do not know enough to be able to speak uh, authoritatively on, there are two things that are the gist of what they said, which I think are really important, which is uh, one, that the vaccines are not working the way that they were supposed to. Uh, and this line of argument is we took the vaccines, we've taken a booster, and yet we've either got Omicron or we don't see any end in sight to the panic and, and anxiety that we feel. And the second, which is closely related to it, is uh, the US government is lying to us because something's not quite right and something doesn't quite add up. Uh, I, I think that there's something there. I think they're right. Uh, perhaps not in the way that they think they're right, but they're right. And we should pay attention to it. Why? Uh, because the vaccines aren't working in the way that we think they should. When we look at the way vaccines, especially the mRNA vaccines that uh, you have access to in the United States, were supposed to protect us against the original COVID strain, uh, what we call the wild type, uh, they had very high rates of protection against everything. Uh, they had high rates of protection against transmission, which means that they helped at, at, to a great extent to prevent you from getting infected. And they had high rates of protection against hospitalization and death. However, uh, we know that what we're dealing with now is by no means the original COVID variant. We had six months into vaccines being put out, the Delta variant, which came from India, uh, because of our own lack of vaccinations at that time in April and May, a horrific time to live through in India. But what Delta did is it made all of the vaccines out in the world less effective. Flash forward another six months and we had the Omicron variant. And what the Omicron variant did is it made all of these vaccines even less effective. And to a certain extent, the US government is lying to you when they say that they have this under control until they can figure out a way by which my parents, half the world's population that lives in poor countries have access to a vaccine in the same quantities and to the same extent as rich countries like the United States and Europe do, the chances of us being able to guarantee that we won't see another variant come out in the next six months that will make the vaccines that we have even less effective uh, just can't be made. And so the truth is that there is a kind of lie that the US government is selling, which is that, there, that things are under control, even in the United States, by virtue of not doing almost, almost anything really, but certainly not as much as they could do to vaccinate the world. In effect, that is a letdown of the taxpayers and the residents and the citizens in the United States who enable these vaccines to Come to market in the first place. Omicron is, is, is such a complex thing to speak of because the, the dominant news about Omicron, which of course you've heard and maybe even experienced, is that it produces a milder infection. The severity is lower, which means that there are lower chances of you being hospitalized or uh, uh, certainly dying. Uh, in general, the data from the United States suggests that it's really only unvaccinated people who've had severe reactions with Omicron, that it has largely, even while uh, infecting people who've been vaccinated or boosted, not produced severe infection. The truth is a little more complex though, because what it's done for vaccine effectiveness has been genuinely disastrous. While prior to Omicron, we had a range of different vaccines that could help us, uh, vaccines from the United States, from Europe, but also vaccines from other parts of the world, which were not mRNA vaccines. Uh, India has one called Covaxin, which is a very old type of vaccine technology, the inactivated virus, uh, uh, which uh, the China has two vaccines, uh, the Sinopharm and the Sinovac vaccines. These have been used by about over half the world's population. What happened with Omicron is that it rearranged what vaccines can be of use and can't in this way. Uh, prior to Omicron, the rates of difference between protection against infection of an mRNA vaccine and an adenoviral vector vaccine, such as Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, or an inactivated virus vaccine, were, were significant but low. They were between 15% uh, and 20% or 25% at the most. 
What happened after Omicron is that the difference in levels of protection that an mRNA vaccine offers as compared to these others uh, can be very high. It can be 40 to 50 percent. There's no question that if you were to take a booster today in a situation where the COVID pandemic is essentially Omicron, you would want to take an mRNA booster. The other vaccines uh, will offer some protection against hospitalization and death, but the marginal improvement in getting boosted with, let's say, an AstraZeneca vaccine that my parents got boosted with last week uh, is, is relatively low uh, to the point of being almost insignificant. The second way in which it rearranged the vaccine landscape is that uh, companies like Pfizer and Moderna have already started working on an Omicron variant specific booster, which they hope to bring to market in as close as the next few months. They're also working together on the next generation of COVID vaccines. And so all of these new vaccine efforts around Omicron and, and future variants will be mRNA vaccines. The very first vaccines to come to market will be mRNA vaccines. At this moment, it's unlikely if the, the other vaccine manufacturers who make older technologies will even work on reformulated versions of their vaccines. What we do know is that in the short run, in the next few months and in the next year, we will be looking at a variety of new solutions to contain this pandemic that come in the form of mRNA vaccines. And the thing with them is that in, in, in the entire country of India, where I live, for instance, there's absolutely no access to them. So that's one sixth of humanity uh, and they have no access to what in very few months might become the only tool that we have to protect ourselves against Omicron and future variants. The problem with this is that it is something that the European Union and the United States can solve if they wish to, even if, for instance, what they say at the moment is true, that contractually, that in the existing laws of the United States and under the kinds of uh, provisions that the Constitution guarantees, there is no way by which the White House can compel Moderna, a vaccine that you funded from start to finish, uh, to share its technology with other vaccine manufacturers around the world. There is a level of moral pressure that the US government, that US citizens can exert on companies, especially companies like Moderna, to, to, to tell them that this is a situation like that movie, Don't Look Now, Don't Look Up, sorry, where what, what, what we're staring down is a, is a comet-shaped pandemic that is, that is hitting the earth. And we know we have a solution to save the earth, but we've, we're arguing over whether it's legal to. So just the act of exerting moral pressure, the act of demanding that we can see the solution inside, that it requires actions in order to effect, uh, would, would have a huge difference in the way companies like Moderna or even Pfizer and BioNTech uh, operate. It, it's, it, they operate on the basis of uh, a mistaken goodwill that the governments of places like Germany and the United States and even in to some extent, the citizens of these countries have for these companies. I think if they realized uh, as firmly as I can see it, that these companies are not the solution, but the problem, that they have a solution that they are actively withholding from a range of manufacturers across the world. A colleague and I identified over a hundred companies who could make these vaccines and, and see us through not just the immediate phases of this pandemic, but, but future phases all through the next couple of years, we would, we would begin to think of them differently. Over the last year or so, uh, we've been working on this effort to increase mRNA access. And in the last couple of weeks, we've had conversations with a range of different US administration officials. And one of the curious things that came up in conversations with the White House COVID-19 task force with uh, a couple of other departments of the US government as well is how little they understand of the kinds of solutions uh, people like me, but a range of other people who are working outside the United States are asking for in order to save ourselves. And sometimes, unfortunately, these solutions come into conflict with what a small group of American activists have been asking uh, for, for from the US government on our behalf, right? 
I work with a, a number of different American individuals and organizations, and I'm very proud to, and many of them, I think, see eye to eye with us. However, I think the kinds of solutions that have reached the US government have come from uh, one or two different American organizations, uh, Prep for All and Public Citizen, where the idea is not so much to distribute vaccine manufacturing around the world, but to get the United States to pay for mRNA vaccines for people like my parents. This comes firstly at a huge cost in the several billions of dollars, so hundreds of dollars per taxpaying family in the United States. And unfortunately, this is uh, providing the wrong solution. Uh, my parents or the government of India actually has the money. They both have the money to be able to pay for vaccines themselves. The vaccines simply don't exist. And uh, to be setting up a system of sort of endless charity where the United States has to behave like the world's rich uncle, I think is bad both for the United States as well as for the people who need, who are the recipients of that charity, who can uh, far more sustainably and better make these vaccines for themselves, for ourselves into the future. And so I was surprised as well, I think by a, a curious symptom of the Biden government's dysfunction, which is, um, I think, deeply interesting divides in the way people who work on vaccine activism approach this themselves to, to try to solve the problem. And I occasionally find it sort of oddly humiliating that I have to uh, fight so hard to make a case for how I should be saved. Um, and I think it should be easier to do that. Uh, but that's the situation we find in nevertheless, one where um, I had to take my parents last week to get an AstraZeneca booster, which I knew from the data provides exactly 0% pro protection against transmission of Omicron. It's not something that I'm happy with. It's something, however, that I see uh, no solution to in India over the next couple of months, unless something dramatically changes. So I, I certainly hope it does. I, I look forward very much to staying in the conversation and taking some questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Dennis. Um, and then, you know, if questions are coming up, keep those in mind. We will have a Q&A with all the speakers uh, as soon as all the opening remarks are done. So uh, Dennis is a nurse in the Chicago Public Schools and a rank and file activist in the Chicago Teachers Union and a member of Tempest. Uh, Dennis. Good, uh, good Sunday to everybody. Um, so, you know, as the introduction said, I am a registered nurse and I'm just, I was thinking back uh, in, in preparation, preparing for this um, discussion about the first experiences that um, I had when the pandemic was surfacing in March of 2020. In addition to my job as a, a nurse in schools, I also work part-time in a hospital and I happened to be working at Providence Hospital at the time, um, which is on the south side of Chicago. And I got a call two days after a shift that I worked that I had been exposed to somebody who was positive for COVID. A uh, patient had fallen down in the, and I was working in the emergency room, a patient had fallen down in the waiting area. And so I rushed out there with a wheelchair and a uh, paper mask, which is, you know, not particularly uh, protective against COVID. And this patient lifted this patient onto the wheelchair and brought him into the ER and, and, and did more uh, work with them. And then my boss called me two days later saying, oh, this person, by the way, tested positive. Um, you should probably, um, you know, keep an eye out for any symptoms. And I asked them, like, well, where can I get tested? They're like, well, that's a good question. You should, you should figure that out um, on your own. And Chicago at the time was running these, the National Guard actually was running these massive testing sites um, for people who work in healthcare. And so I drove out to this uh, forest preserve over on the, the western edge of the city and waited three hours in a line of cars to, to be tested for, for COVID. And, and while I was waiting in line, I saw someone else in a car who I knew from my days in the emergency room at, at County, which is the main hospital, uh, in one of the main public health hospitals in Chicago. He, he was a paramedic and now he worked for the fire department. And he was also waiting uh, in line. So we were just talking on the phone while we were waiting there for this, for this COVID testing. And he was telling me, in the, and so he works at the fire department, you know, and their, their tests, their checks um, for every day was supposed to be part of um, their coming into work. Like, so they work a 24 hour shift. They're supposed to check their temperatures to make sure no one had any kind of fever. Uh, the fire department does not provide thermometers for their rigs. They just didn't have them. That's not a thing that they had for their employees. And so one of the firefighters uh, couldn't find a thermometer anywhere. 
not they, they were all out because of the pandemic. People were buying up thermometers uh, for for personal use, which you know makes sense. Um, so the only thing they were able to find was a thermometer that checks the temperature of automobiles. And so this firehouse that this person was working at was getting safety checks every morning, <laughs> being scanned by a device that's meant for for cars, which doesn't have the kind of uh, fine tuned. Uh, temperature that you would want, actually want to, to check human bodies. Um, but in any case, that's what was happening in the third largest city in the richest country of humanity for a, a social service such as, as fire departments. Um, and it just, it just really, I think, indicates what the problem is with capitalism uh, and, and coming into contact with COVID. Uh, you go from just in time production to not at all production, you know, where you just don't have the stuff that you need, like thermometers uh, to check people's temperature if they're going to go into a workforce and go into houses where there are sick people and, and possibly transmit the disease to them. Um, it's a combination of, of a profit system that centers the making of money uh, uh, with severe incompetence, with severe governmental incompetence when it comes to managing this disease. I think capitalism has always gotten us on both ends, but getting us coming and getting us going and they make money on both ends and that's how the system has always uh, worked. I mean, one analogy I think about in healthcare um, is, is diabetes. You know, you have uh, a food industry which puts sugar into everything uh, and then p people develop health conditions as a result of it. And oh, yeah, oh wait, we got a medicine for that too. It's called insulin and we're gonna charge you through the nose uh, if you need that because you happen to catch diabetes from the uh, awful food system we have set up. So it's a, a capitalism gets us um, on both ends. Uh, and, and in this pandemic, we've seen the richest uh, people make even more outrageous amounts of money. In the time from March of 2020 until October of this, of 21, you know, just a few months ago, there were 130 more billionaires created just in, just in this country, just the United States. Um, their collective wealth went from $3 trillion to, to $5 trillion in that, in that time period. So now there are 745 some billionaires, uh, 145, 130 of them are brand new just in the past couple of years during a crisis which has resulted in deaths of uh, hundreds of thousands in this country, millions around the world, millions of infections um, everywhere. The, this, the, the abject inability of, of capitalism to manage this is really apparent for anyone uh, with, with, uh, with the ability to, to, to see what's happening. Um, and at the same time, you have people losing their jobs, losing health insurance, uh, in desperation, losing family members to, to this disease. You have people like Jeff Bezos shooting himself in the space for, for giggles. Um, and so that, that contradiction just is just really uh, amazing um, to me. I think the other aspect of this is the racism that this country was founded upon. I mean, let's remember the United States was founded upon genocide and slavery. Racism is as deep as the oldest trees in this country. Um, the death disparity, uh, life expectancy disparity in Chicago before COVID was already uh, abysmal. Um, in that in the neighborhood I worked in, uh, Providence, just south of there is a neighborhood called Eng Englewood. Um, and there the life, average life expectancy in Englewood, which is a very poor area, predominantly African-American is about 60. That's the, that's the average life expectancy. Just eight miles north of there, you could literally uh, walk or in the course of the year, ride a bike very easily to Streeterville, uh, which is where the Magnificent Mile is. They have very nice uh, stores where you can, you can buy all kinds of luxury items. The average life expectancy there is, is 90. So this is before the pandemic, Chicago, the third largest city, again, the richest country in the history of, of humanity has a 30 year life gap between two neighborhoods that are literally uh, miles apart. Um, and this is before this disease uh, hit our doors. And at Provident, when, they, when, when somebody tested positive, when a, when a worker tested positive, which is like pretty much understood that, that now, they sh that she's closed the ER. So Provident is on the south side of Chicago. It's the, one of the first black hospitals. They closed the ER for two weeks saying that they were gonna do some kind of renovations. And they, this is when the, the coronavirus was just uh, just ripping through Chicago, where you had death disparities. Um, African Americans, who make up about 30% of the population, accounted for 70% of deaths. So, on the South Side in Chicago, in a Black neighborhood, they're closing down ERs while people turn the news on and see people that look like them dying every day. I mean, that's just a complete, uh, completely astounding thing that was happening. And this was being done 
by Democratic uh, politicians. This is the, the Cook County is run by um, the president is, 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 a, is one of the, the, the leaders in the Democratic Party locally, um, as well as nationally. Uh, and so it's just amazing to me that, that you would shut down a hospital on the south side of Chicago in the midst of a pandemic. And again, let's get let's be clear on why it is that the African American death rate is higher. It's not because there's some melanin linked gene, which makes you more likely to die from COVID. It's because there's a preponderance of diseases of poverty within that uh, population. You have more likelihoods for asthma, um, diabetes, high blood pressure. Those are all diseases that are based not upon some uh, uh, choice who your parents you made, uh, but it's based upon if you live in an area that does not have proper access to health care, uh, uh, quality food, clean air, uh, decent jobs, which gives you access to health care uh, and, and, and decent food, all the rest of it. All those things are diseases of poverty. And this is why we saw disproportionate um, deaths. And that's also, I think, why we understand that there's 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 hesitancy around uh, some people being vaccinated. I mean, you look at some of the maps of Chicago about where people are getting vaccinated. You can see part of it is due to access. So areas that are predominantly um, poor African-American uh, Latino, Latina are going to have partly less access to vaccines, but also there's real hesitancy that is a product of a system that is racist. So people have a distrust of a healthcare system which has done bad things to them, and that's understandable. Or don't have access to to healthcare and and, and that um, those conversations to talk about their uh, hesitancies around vaccines. So those things go together. And then as the previous speaker Acher was uh, was making the point around the racism internationally, where you have uh, former colonial subjects such as uh, India who uh, were, are now being are, are vaccine deserts, where people just don't have access to vaccines at all. Um, it's not about hesitancy, but it's not even having that. And, 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 and as, the, as, as he was saying, this leads to more variants, which then blow back to the United States and cause more, um, more chaos. So the next main point I wanted to make was just about the current approach of this of this government of this system, which is basically get back to work. Um, obviously, they've been making great profits. They want to continue that. They want to, um, and they, they, it's there's a carrot and a stick aspect to that. Probably mostly more more stick than carrot. I would imagine is the is the typical approach of this of this society. Uh, they the the cutting off of of funding for people who are from unemployment. Um, the, the reducing of CDC requirements, like in California, not, across the country now, it's like five days, basically, is the, is the quarantine period if you've been exposed. In California, they were specifically telling nurses that if you are COVID positive, you should go back to work as long as you don't have symptoms, which just doesn't make any sense <laughs> whatsoever. Like, why would you want people who are sick and infected with COVID going into places where people who are already sick with something who I would assume are there because they have some health need uh, and are therefore at a greater risk for infection uh, being in those same spaces. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, so this is, again, this is uh, what's driving this is get back to work. Um, but fortunately, uh, there's been resistance to this. I mean, there's been resistance all across this country to what's what's happening um, with, this, with this disease. Uh, here, you know, we saw strike October, uh, some some months ago in this country, not necessarily one to one fighting for um, against COVID and, and, and of the health conditions, Oh, some of them were like, for example, I work as a school nurse, that's my main primary job. And I'm a member of the Chicago Teachers Union. And during this past winter, you know, some months ago, we had a um, a work action, a collective action we took. CTU is made up of about 25,000 um, educators. And when we were supposed to be coming back from winter break was when Omicron was peaking in, in the Chicago area, well, across this country. Um, and so you had positivity rates of 23, 24%. Um, even higher in some neighborhoods. And so we took collective action. We're like, we don't think it's safe for us to be back uh, in spaces. Uh, by us, we mean students, uh, workers, uh, parents, all the rest of it in those spaces when this disease is going through our neighborhoods uh, like wildfire. And so we took a vote. We, we took a collective action. So for four days, we basically said, we're willing to um, work, but they basically responded by locking us out. And again, this is a city that is not run by some uh, 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 Trumpian, um, 
you could argue maybe they are Trumpian, but it's a, the, the Democratic Party. Lori Lightfoot is the mayor of Chicago. She is a Democratic uh, Party member and was on national news, you know, talking about how what she was doing was right. Um, she particularly took time to, take, to talk about how nurses and schools weren't doing enough. You even had Dr. Awadi, who's the chief health official in, in Chicago, saying she wished nurses would get more involved. I mean, just really insulting um, people. But it, it's not accidental. These were not accidental comments. These were not just off the cuff things. They want to smash the idea that there could be any kind of resistance to uh, their program, their program of profit. And so all this, this stuff about teachers resisting um, or, or teachers pushing for, for, for mass mandates or this, all this stuff about how there's been terrible learning loss because these, these teachers just want to you know, work from home or, or, or lazy or whatever the, the latest thing is. Those are things that are concretely being put out because they want to smash not only any kind of idea that we, we should just not return the normal, that this is the new normal, you have to take risk, but anyone who resists that needs to be, um, uh, needs to be smashed down. Uh, and that's why I think they're, 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 they're going back to attacking um, teachers right now. Uh, and that's why it's important that we're standing up. There's nothing really special about teachers. There's nothing, any, any workplace should have a fight uh, and organizing around safety measures in their in their workplaces. Uh, it just happens to be that that the teachers union in Chicago is organized very much around uh, community bargaining, around a, a militant uh, history that goes back uh, decades. And so that's why we took a stand, but there's really nothing special about it. And so I definitely, I'm looking, I have seen other uh, spaces where workers have also stood up and fought, you know, Amazon, um, uh, grocery store workers, hopefully in some places are fighting, are fighting back around this stuff. So the other side of this um, incompetence by the people who run this society is, is providing space for the growth of the far right. Uh, so because when, when mainstream politics doesn't provide an answer, doesn't provide solutions, doesn't provide an explanation for what's happening, you have people like the January 6th types who are out there saying, oh, we're going to uh, bring Trump back in. We're gonna we're gonna make every we're gonna make America great again. We're not gonna have anybody telling me what to do as far as vaccine mandates. You see this Canadian uh, trucker uh, so-called movement of really you know small business types uh, funded by the far right. Um, the 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 flu trucks the flu trucks clucks is, is what I've heard them uh, be characterized as. Um, but it's it's kind of a bizarre space that we are now where the far right is also trying trying to use this opportunity to grow their to grow their forces say we also have an explanation they're, they certainly do want people to get back to work and make money uh, and all the rest of it but they're also posing themselves as an alternative to, to to biden and the democratic party and that's why i think it's important you know to to wrap things up that we have to talk about building building the left we have to go beyond the democratic party i mean look at this this whole debate that we had uh, in this country around these these bills to 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 inject some money into funding things like child care or, or 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 parental leave like if you have a baby you shouldn't be going back to work and the days following you giving a delivery bringing life into the world uh is is is, is, is something that most other every other country every other uh, country in this planet has this leave for people who've just had a child but in this country not even that could get through the likes of 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 uh, mansion and cinema who blocked um biden's even meager plans around that and the democratic party as a whole did very did not just did nothing to mobilize people to fight around this. There were no rallies saying we demand these things like healthcare for all, we demand child leave, we demand uh, workplace safety things. None of that stuff was done by the Democratic Party. And again, that leaves that seeds ground to the far right to kind of be be a space. Um, but again, I think it, it further imposes upon us to build the left, to build a socialist alternative, to say there is a different way. You look at all the resources that were dumped, that were poured into creating a, a vaccine. Billions and billions of dollars, resources poured into that effort so that they could create a vaccine in record amounts of time. They've never seen a vaccine created in this fast. So they can't tell us that resources don't exist to fight things like this uh, in the world right now. But what we need is a different kind of society, a society that's based upon meeting people's needs, not based upon being the profit of the tiny. And that's why we have to continue as socialists to fight and organize alongside of our coworkers, our, 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 our people in our neighborhood, people in our workplaces, uh, people in our schools to fight for this kind of uh, society. So I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, I am just going to make a comment. It's it's great to see people participating in the chat. If we could keep the chat to a minimum until our presenters are done, so the attention is not divided and we can uh, hear the rest of them, we, there will be a chance to either get on stack and 
contribute to the conversation or ask your questions to get those answered as soon as the introductory comments are done. Um, and next we have Greg, who is a global health activist and epidemi epidemiologist, epidemiologist, and an associated professor at the Yale School of Public Health. Uh, Greg, it's all you. Thanks so much. Um, so, you know, I started writing about the COVID pandemic with my friend Amy Kapczynski, who Oxel knows well. Um, and in March 2020, with three essays in the Boston Review, which um, I'm going to sort of try to spit out a lot of that and update it um, in the time I have to talk to you. Um, we're teaching a course right now called Health Justice Towards the Politics of Care, um, which also deals with many of these issues. And next week is uh, a session on confronting private power, which I think. Um, speaks to Achal and, and, and Danny's comments as well. So <clears throat> for Amy and me, the roots of this pandemic stretch way beyond the past few years in our collective history. Um, you know, the frail state of our public health system and social protections, which are um, uh, far deficient in comparison to our uh, rich country peers, the bloated top heavy healthcare system that we have here are, are, are a product of what we, you know, what some called racial capitalism, which is the marriage of white supremacy and, and the free market in this country. And it set us up for the catastrophic failure of our COVID-19 response with the share of Americans who've been killed by the coronavirus at least 63% times higher than any of the other large wealthy nations um, of Europe, Canada, and, and, and some of East Asia. And so we all know the disaster of 2020 in which a man with no real qualifications and the poster boy for crony capitalism just made a mess of the pandemic. Uh, and I'm speaking about President Trump, but it's not clear that our fundamentals were sound going into the pandemic. And while mismanagement, corruption, and incompetence made things worse, um, it's not clear that Trump was the worst of our problems virus-wise. Um, in fact, the death toll from COVID in 2021 and into this new year is higher than that of the first year without vaccines. Like, let that soak in, you know, let that soak in. Um, first, what happened, right? So the ability to protect oneself from the virus in 2020 was income dependent. Could you afford to stay home? Well, we could have subsidized salaries with pandemic pay or wage subsidies um, to allow people to social distance during the height of the early waves. We could have paid people who were sick to stay home or exposed to stay home. I um, mean, some countries did this, but we didn't. Um, so the rich stayed home and the poor subsidized their safety by continuing to work in frontline professions, right? In Amazon warehouses to supply those sheltering places with anything they needed. Um, and those at workplaces exploded with cases throughout the pandemic. Those are the largest clusters of COVID-19 in 2020. Amazon warehouses, meat packing plants, um, poultry packing plants, other sort of food service uh, 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 warehouses. We also made a decision not to mobilize national industries to scale up things like PPE. I mean, how many people remember the, the, the poor healthcare workers creating do-it-yourself protection to protect themselves um, in 2020 and websites popping up to help them source key items? Um, the decisions to scale up testing were also rejected in 2020. President Trump had a uh, uh, proposal on the table to scale up rapid testing, decided to reject it. Um, the one place, as Ottawa suggested, where government intervened, government intervened was in vaccine R&D. Um, and the investment did pan out, uh, depending on who you were and where you lived. Because even with the NIH involvement in the US support for the uh, development of Moderna's vaccine and some of the other uh, immunogens, the companies that manufactured the vaccines were given carte blanche monopoly power to control the market on them. So basically, in the first uh, in, in, in the in the first scenario, rich countries hoarded vaccines, and poor countries still go without. Um, there's a website called Pandem hyphen IC Pandemic um, dot com by um, Phil Shulkins, who's an economist, who put up a post today talking about the. the disparities in vaccine access. There's less than 10% of people in Sub-Saharan Africa where, where I did HIV work in my past that have no access to, to vaccines, less than 10, 10%. I mean, if we're talking about MR vaccines, it's basically nil. Um, so Biden was supposed to be better. And, you know, in fact, his initial plans were much more comprehensive, expansive, and focused on equity um, beyond what you'd expect with his centrist sort of um, uh, uh, democratic roots. Because I think the scientists around him were saying this, and this is what needed to happen to address the pandemic. Um, and even though the American Rescue Plan could have been larger and more sweeping, it was an important piece of legislation given the resistance he faced, right? But something happened 
in 2021, and I do not understand what it is. Um, even though the, the sort of rank misinformation was gone, the ambition of the president's early plans evaporated early on in 2021. So there's no longer talking about scaling up testing and masks and a whole range of sort of proposals that are in a document that they published on the White House website in January 21. He switched to a vaccine only approach to the pandemic and the year ended with his press secretary mocking calls to scale up rapid testing and provision of masks to the American public even if they backtracked you know, a few weeks later with a small send out of tests for people who asked for them. Um, what it was, I don't know what happened, but what it was was return to the idea that the state couldn't do more, couldn't do better um, than just to urge people to get vaccinated. The president had a speech in December where he just kept saying, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, um, and really offering little else in terms of hope uh, during the, the beginning of the Omicron wave. Um, and back was Biden the centrist, right? With no state, uh, no faith in the state to do more, even in the face of catastrophic suffering that we've seen over the past few months alone. It was a liberal defeatism, right? In which, which has infected the party for decades in which the, the era of big government was over as President Clinton used to say. And in some way we're back where we started in 2020. Um, those who can protect themselves in subsequent ways will do so. They'll have access to rapid tests because they'll, they'll have the time to scour CVSs, Walgreens, and Rite Aids to find them. They'll find the N95s to protect themselves, and they'll have the doctors who will get Pavlovid if they need it, the antibody therapy uh, to, to prevent serious hospitalization and death, and they'll get their next booster right away. Um, and those who have less resources will continue as a subsidizer or comfort in 2020 um, to subsidize it again as COVID marches across the planet. And as Achill said, we can't even manage to ensure that the world gets vaccinated out of our own damn self-interest. We're waiting once again for the market to provide, even though the calls for public production have been on the table since 2020, even before the vaccines were approved for use, before any vaccines were approved, there were, there were calls from the People's Vaccine Movement and others to, to provide for public production, for, for sale at, um, uh, at the cost of production, et cetera. And even though we've begged, protested, and screamed at the White House, they've just said no on this. Um, and this is about capture by industry, about Albert Borla and Stephen Bensell setting the terms of, of debate on vaccines in this country. It is not because they don't know what to do. Um, you know, so all of this happened before and will happen again. It happened with TB in the 20th century, uh, early in the 20th century, which people who once feared the disease moved on as potent antibiotics arrived in TB, which still kills millions became a disease of the poor worldwide. And HIV, well, after white middle-class gay men like myself got access to AIDS medicines in 1996, they went back to their lives. Well, HIV headed into gay communities of young African-American men out of the gay neighborhoods in the urban North and into the rural South. So what now? Well, racial capitalism is killing us. And some of us, um, no matter who we are, think we have privileged dental for us, but it won't right? Um, while the probability of you getting infected and dying from COVID is far less than, than, than um, uh, others who are unvaccinated or undervaccinated or not boosted or have underlying conditions, um, many of us live with, with uh, uh, immunocompromised relatives or immunocompromised ourselves, um, and we don't know what new variants will come down the pike um, that, that might make our current vaccines uh, impotent uh, in protecting us all. And, you know, if we've shown ourselves incapable of rising to this challenge, um, what does it mean in terms of climate catastrophe that's, that's on our doorstep over the next decades? If a once in a century pandemic can't get people to change their ways, what hope do we have for the future? Um, and so I think we have to think about building a new culture of resistance, right? Because the, addressing COVID is inseparable from the fight for economic, social, and racial justice in the US and around the world. And our plight with this virus is just a downstream effect of our failures to confront our history. Um, and the left, for all its um, Sturm und Drang, has not built a mass movement that the right has in this country. It just hasn't done so. Um, but you know, even that said, it's never too late to fight back. And Larry Kramer once said, plague, plague, we're in the middle of a plague and you behave like this. 40 million infected people is a plague. Until we get our acts together, all of us, we're as good as dead. Truer words were never said. It's time to get to business. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our panelists. Uh, we are going to end the live stream at this time. So if you are watching via the live stream and you would like to partake in the conversation or the Q&A, please uh, follow the Zoom link in the chat and join us on the Zoom. Um, we are going to open it up.